Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Data Color webinar with Potch Kelly, Portraiture and Landscape Photography. I'm Boris Bergman, and with me tonight it's uh, Potch Kelly. Nice to have you here Thank tonight. You. And Richard West. Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Hey, Boris. Good, thanks. You? Back from holiday, right? <laughs> I am indeed. I am slightly tanned at the moment, but uh, otherwise all, all good. <laughs> okay. So, what we will do tonight, we will see how Poch uh, is creating his superb images uh, you might have seen before. We will have a look into how he's doing it. And so, this is uh, for, for the next, let's say, upcoming 60 minutes, maybe a few minutes more a few minutes less. Um, and after this we will go into the chat and you have the possibility to enter all the questions you have. This webinar will be recorded, excluding the chat at the end, and you will be able to see the recording at our website and you get the information where to find the recording also with the follow-up uh, mail you receive um, hopefully tomorrow afternoon. Okay, that's from me now, and I will hand you over now to Poch one second. So, Poch, now you're able to share your screen with us. Please do so. And okay. It's your turn now. Thank you. So, is that, can you see that now, Rick? Coming up mm -hmm. any second, I think. Um, try again. <laughs> Show my screen. Yeah, that's the one. There we go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there we go. That's the one. Have you all, you all have that now, yes? We can indeed. Can you see? We can see you sitting okay. naked in your, in your office there. Right. It's disturbing. That's perfect. Perfect. As long as I'm not embarrassing myself, that's the main exactly. thing. Uh, <laughs> good evening, everybody, um, and uh, welcome cool. to this webinar. Uh, Boris, thank you very much for having me. Uh, Richard, as well. Um, for those of you who don't know, Richard's been away enjoying himself for the last couple of weeks, so we're all working hard when he's only back. So, welcome back, Rich. Uh, looking forward to hearing all about it. Um, my talk um, basically is about sort of the work I've done and do uh, but I also would like to try and get across to you as well that um, before all the digital came in that we are all very um, much creative. Oh hello, have we got a little freeze going on? Can Boris you there? Hello. Yes I am. Yes, I okay, am. for some reason my screen had seemed to lock up. No, there we it's go. Okay. We're off it's and running okay. again. Great. Okay. Uh, we're good. up and running again. Uh, sorry about that. Um, what I'm finding is that a lot of people are looking at images from way back uh, and realizing that the creativity that we've... Oh, hello. Sorry, boys. I don't know what's going wrong here. My screen keeps freezing. Uh, but you can, we can hear you. No problem. That was okay. okay. Uh, uh, can you? Yeah. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know why this is not sort of working as smoothly as it did the other day. Um, the images that I have that you're sort of seeing here now, we will see some of the dates. They're going back to the 90s and so on like that. Because what I want to try and get across to people is that. The creativity is within yourself. It's not within the cameras and the lenses and Photoshop and Lightroom and all the rest. But it's within you. What you see and then how you get it across to the viewer. Um, so what you're seeing here is images that I have taken over the years before the digital. Okay. Um, so basically, what do I do for myself? I do landscape for myself and I do portrait and, and fashion and all that kind of stuff for myself and art nude and still lives and everything else. And as a business, I would be doing portraiture as well uh, and weddings and some commercial work as well. The landscape I do is, I suppose if anybody knows me, they will know that I'm a sort of a lazy landscaper. I, I am one of these uh, people who won't walk 45 miles in to get a landscape. Uh, I won't walk 45 minutes probably, but normally I will find a nice spot, go in, and then I, I will find the viewpoints and I will then exploit it to the best of my ability. Um, 
I love the landscapes, but I don't get up at half four in the morning, and I won't go, you know, out at sort of three o'clock to be there for four. I will go whenever it sort of takes my fancy. So um, my landscapes will be geared to when I get to a specific location, what I can find. I know that the lighting in the mornings and the evenings is a lot better because it will give you sort of shadows and details and you'll see the undulating sort of hills and rolling stuff like that. <clears throat> but any time of the day, you can go and you can photograph your landscapes. So if like me, you're out there thinking, I'd love to be doing some landscapes um, and I want to be a lazy landscaper, let's say, like me, you can sort of go out at any time of the day. But be warned, you have to work a little bit harder at it than if you're out sort of earlier because the lighting will make a big difference. Uh, the other thing too is when I'm out in the landscape and I'm shooting, I will shoot with my Nikons just in case there's sort of some gadget people out there who want to know, oh, what do you shoot with? I shoot with Nikons, Fujis, uh, I have a Hazzy which probably hasn't been out of the bag properly in a couple of months now at this stage, and my iPhone. So I will shoot with everything that I have when I'm out in uh, even with my portrait, as you will see later on, um, I will shoot with a selection of lenses, selection of cameras, selection of equipment, even to my iPhone. So whatever the camera is, I don't care. I will make it work for me uh, the best I can. The thing is, when I get in, we will see some images um, of my before and afters. In other words, I have a way of sort of uh, images for you to see what they came out of the camera looking like, and then what I have done to them. So again, you need to have your own vision as to what you want the end result to be. So, you know, we're, we're working er, very hard to go out into the landscape or into the portraits, which you'll see now very shortly, uh, to get really lovely images. So we need to sort of plan ahead sometimes of what we want. In other words, sort of pre-visualize when you take a shot, how you feel it will finish. In other words, when you shoot it, which just say this particular image that's up here now at the moment, it's shot fairly early in the day, um, although people would look at the, the movement in the water and say, well, it must be very low light and everything else. The light was actually quite strong, but I was using a big, heavy, neutral density filter on it. I think it's one of those um, variable ones that goes from two stops to 10 stops. I never used a 10 stop one because you start getting a little bit of a crosshair scenario going on, but I would use something like about eight stops, close right down, you know, my lowest ISO that's on the camera on a tripod, and this was shot in around about sort of 12, one o'clock in the day. So you can see the way you get the movement and everything else. So it's knowing your equipment and having an idea of what you want when you're starting to shoot figuring like you want to bring in the dramatic clouds and in your head you know you're going to go into something maybe like the Nick filters or something to bring out the tonal contrast and things like that. Okay. Also when you're out in the landscape, for me anyway particularly, I will also look for different things from the landscape, sort of in other words, that like what's in the fields when I find a field like this of the wheat and the, the poppies and so on. And this is shot with an infrared camera that was converted, or a camera that was converted to infrared. Unfortunately, has long died on me. Um, it was a little Canon G9 that was given to me as a present. Um, and when I went into the field and started playing with it um, to get these shots, I will then, the landscapes, I will look for nuances within the landscape as well. So it's not just um, taking these big, fabulous vistas. I will get in close and I will sort of pick out little bits within the landscape. Now, in our landscapes now, if I was going for competition and I was sort of putting this into a competition and reworking it, I would probably go into the background then and take out the telegraph poles. But then again, I'm going, actually, believe it or not, I'm not that pushed anymore because these are part of our landscape. We see them all the time. So if they're right in the middle and taking your eye away, then I would get upset about it. Um, but other than that, there are certain things I think we go a little bit overboard when we're starting to sort of look and change things. So like when you're looking at your landscapes, if there is happen to be a telegraph pole or a, a, some kind of a, a man-made object in it, have a really good look and see, do you need to take it out or is it part of our landscape that we live in today? 
you know. But this is my, again, I should have started off by saying, this is just the way I shoot. This is just the way I work. This is just the way I see things. Um, I'm not saying it's right. Uh, and I know Boris said earlier on, which is uh, frightening when I hear people saying, like, oh, these are superb images and so on like that. Uh, they're superb to me. I think they're brilliant. I love them. But then again, I'm big into my own photography. Some people look at them and go, Ugh, that's the beauty of photography. We revoke an, a reaction to, to our images, and that's what we're looking for. So as I said, in the landscape, I will look for little nuances like this, okay, or like this. And then I will play with the depth of field, uh, or bokeh, as people are calling it now. Um, I'm old, so I came from the depth of field generation and so on. Um, but again, it's, it's a case of what you fancy when you're out there shooting, because no one can tell you how to go out and see a really good shot or how you know, you're going to get it. Because even though some guys look at this particular shot that I've taken, they say to me, God, you were up very early in the morning, look at that mist, it's, you, know, you must have been waiting all morning for it to clear. And to be truthful, to be very truthful, I was at to be away for a weekend with my wife, we were in the hotel, we were at the having a really good night the night before, lots of drink taken and eating food, and I woke up at 8 o'clock in the morning and looked out and saw all this mist and, oh, I should get up and go out, and be honest, I was just too hungover. And all I did was stick the camera out the window. So you can be lucky at times to be in the right place at the right time. And that, that, you know, once you understand your equipment, even with a hangover, you know how to expose to get a really nice image. And then again, you can go out very late in the evenings and you can do this kind of land. Now I know people say that's not a landscape, it's more a skyscape, it's more sort of nighttime photography. But if you look, you will see in the bottom there is part of the landscape down there and we're photographing the Milky Way. And that was the first time I've ever done this. It was an absolute eye-opener to me. I was with a gentleman called Ken Skloot, who is an American, and he had brought me out to Monument Valley when we were over there, and literally, I, I have never seen anything like this in my life. I was absolutely gobsmacked. Um, and it was amazing. It was, it was a, a one-in-a-lifetime sort of feeling for me. I have never felt that way before. So your landscapes, you can go out at any time of the day. And as I said, I'd rather go out late in the evenings and into the night time if I can, like you see here, than getting up at four in the morning to do it. But there you go. But we do do that as well, and we did do a few sunrises as well. So it's really cool. What I'm talking about is, is, and this is just a very quick demo, and I'll show an awful lot more of these to you now in a few minutes, of when you're out there working, you see an image. This is in Wicklow in Ireland. That's a really good day in Ireland. That sort of cloudscape and the blue skies and a bit of sun, because uh, normally it's raining and it's cold and miserable like it has been the last few days. But when you see an image, you've got to then think, what do I want to do with it? Where do I want to take it to? What direction do I want to go? You can go and start doing something like H. The HDR effect in this is not taking several shots of this, you know, for the exposed land, you know, the highlights, the shadows, and everything else. It's using a plug-in afterwards to get the effect, and that's what we've done on this, along with one or two other things as well. But you can completely different level and you can put in sun rays and sun bursts and throw in a few boards as well. Like, you know, as you can see here in the, the center where the, the sun cloud and burst is, I have now got a flock of boards that I didn't have at the very start. And to the left-hand side, I have a flock of boards going away and there's actually some rain falling. So your vision is how you want it to be. What you want your landscape, your portraits, your still lives, your figure studies, whatever it is you shoot, it's however you see it. I go to a landscape, and I know some you know, really pure landscape photographers will probably hate me for this, but I go and I drive there and then I'll walk 10 or 15 minutes. I'm, I'm a lazy, I'm, the size of me, you'll understand why. I'm not going to walk 40 minutes in, 50 minutes in, unless it's absolutely spectacular. Uh, most of the stuff that I get is fairly handy for me to get to. Uh, I'm just a lazy landscape photographer. But I get lucky with some of the shots that I get. The portraiture, on the other hand, um, would probably be where I would be most at home, uh, trying to take pictures of people. Uh, and I will use any kind of location, and I will use any kind of lighting. 
Now the difference with this over the landscape is that you are kind of limited with your landscape. You're limited in the sense that you are dictated by the lighting that's there on the day. You can't sort of bring out a couple of bones, flash heads, or a couple of speed lights off your Nikon and decide that you're going to light up a side of a mountain. It doesn't necessarily work. But when it comes to portraiture and so on, you can use any light source that you can to get the result that you want. This is an off-camera flash balanced with the daylight that's there to get this particular image. But I have been known to use everything from bones, Ellen Chrome. Um, I don't have, as such at the moment, a continuous light source other than uh, a low L video light, which I use quite a bit, and torches, apps will just flashlights, um, stuff you'd buy in, in any hardware store that costs you maybe 10, 12, 15 euro, and so on like that. Um, and I will use any light source. I think David Bailey said it best, although he used it a little bit maybe more colorful when in an interview and asked about what the light source, you know, and he said available light. And they said, oh, you use natural light. And he says, no, any mm -mm light there is. So basically, whatever light source is there, you can use it to your advantage. This is flash balanced with daylight um, and it worked quite well for me. This is natural light. This is out in a um, park with a beautiful model um, with you know making sure that we had the right clothes on and uh, in with the go against the greens and the and the browns of the trees and so on and uh, with her red jacket and so on and we found a, a background that suited her hair coloring which was this blondie so we make sure we had sort of darky behind it um, and it literally is just a natural light to stare and then shot through foliage that's in front of me to give this out of focus effect that's on her and, and again that can be used in a lot of places uh, this is Emay Tom, who stood in when I was doing a talk at the Society's Convention uh, last year, the year before last, the year before last. And this is just two speed lights on one stand doing clamshell lighting with two umbrellas that cost me less than 15 euro. So, you know, with your own speed lights that you own, uh, you go and buy a stand which will cost you probably 25, 30, 35 quid euro. Um, and you can get clamps and then you get by two translucent brollies now quite cheap and they're not big brollies these are very they're only maybe about 15 inches you know in in, in diameter um, and you can do clamshell lighting and I've actually used that scenario while shooting a CEO in a company one day because the office he had was quite tight and small and I had very little space to work in so I just brought that in and shot it so clamshell lighting can be done with two speed lights very very simply this was done with a video light. Uh, it's at a wedding. Uh, so everything I use in my own personal work and anything I play with in my own personal work is to help me when I get into wedding scenarios and business scenarios. So anything I play with for myself, I can then translate into business if it works. And this was a, a lighting scenario I played with ages ago. And it's this sort of, I suppose, I used to look at an awful lot of old black and white films, Humphrey Bogart, all that kind of stuff. And it's that kind of deep shadow, you know, menacing look. And this happens to be the best man from the wedding. And they had, as I called them, the James Bond Dickie Bows. And as soon as they opened them, I said to the boys, I want you's. And we went down to this door that had a window and a frame in it. And my assistant is on the other side of the door holding the video light. So we're getting the shadows, we're getting the little shadows on the wall from the window and we're getting the shadows to the right and the left of him of the framework and then it's casting a big long shadow on him. We don't have to have people always looking at us for portraiture. They can be looking away from us. They can be, they don't, like I say, they don't have to be looking at us, you know what I mean, to make a strong portrait. That's my way of thinking. Uh, this particular light source is one big softbox to the right of him, or to the to right as you look at it, should I say, to the right of him as you look at it, and behind him is is just a filler. It's a, it's a reflector, or I can't remember whether that was a reflector or a small light source as well, just to pick up his hair and sort of separate him out from the back. 
And you will see on a few occasions like this as well, where I have chopped into people's foreheads, um, you don't always have to have the whole head in a portrait. You can actually crop in and it works quite well. Uh, especially if somebody has hair and it's receding or bald or whatever. You can actually crop in and it does take that little sort of shine away as well. Um, but this is, is it's a very simple uh, lighting scenario and most of my lighting scenarios are simple because if I complicate them uh, then I'm complicating my head. I want to keep them simple and then just concentrate on getting the portrait of whoever it is I'm photographing. This is a, a friend of mine called Richard. He's a, a biker. He's a bit of a nutcase. He's a lovely, lovely guy. He's a pussycat, really. Um, but I had this cane that I saw a photograph years and years and years ago of, of, of uh, Richard Maplethorpe. Um, and I've always sort of wanted to create something like that. And this is what we've done. Now it's not as good as that particular shot of him, of Mablethorpe, but it's my version of it. There's a, a thing years ago um, I heard from um, Bob Carlos Clark when I'd done an interview with him. And one of the things he said in it is, if you see an idea, take it and make it your own. So it's not that, that we can't come up with our own ideas, but there's no harm in looking at ideas that we've seen in other photographs and then moving on and making our own with them because at this day and age nearly everything has been done in one form or another. So all we can do is when we take our photographs is to try and put our own little bit of personality or something into them. Okay. So this would be work. This would be, well, if, if this wasn't my grandson it would be work and I would have been paid but uh, we didn't actually get paid for this but I had an absolute ball shooting it. Uh, Kids, particularly if we can get them out into the outdoors, it's better because they run around, it's a natural environment for them, and then they play. But you have to be prepared to shoot a lot. Um, and I do. I don't mind shooting. Uh, and I came back from that day, I think I had something like 350 images taken. Because he's like a little Duracell bunny. He has batteries stuck in there somewhere. And he would not stay still. Um, so you have to shoot a lot to get the expression and get the movement and so on. So don't be afraid. I see a lot of people saying, no, if you don't get it in the first five or six shots, then I leave it alone. I just keep shooting until I know I have the exact one I want, then I can throw the rest away. He does stop every now and again, and then when he does, you can still get really, really nice portraits. So again, as I said, a portrait doesn't have to have somebody looking at them. Now, to everybody else, this is just a kid with his back to us, you know, a redhead, whatever. To our family and anybody who knows them, it's, a, it's, it's Aiden. So, I mean, it's, you know, when you're shooting for a client, remember that, that you can actually shoot pieces of a child, because remember, they will know and recognize their own child or their own husband or so on like that. So, so that's what we do. Natural light, I will use an awful lot of, because, again, it's the simplest thing to use. It's there. It's not costing anything. You just have to find the right environment for it. So this is a, a lovely environment of a, a friend of mine had this house that uh, she let me photograph in every now and again. Excuse me. Um, nice big windows, so the light just floods in. So in one area of the house, we had this really natural light. Um, so how, if you're in a studio, can you sort of emulate natural light? Well, it's very hard to emulate natural light in a studio. But you can do it. Uh, I'm not saying that the next image, I just thought there was another image coming before this. Um, but this image, uh, like I say, natural light, I'll come back to this one again. If you just remember it, when I come to one or two more images, um, you will see what I mean. Uh, how you can use natural light in the same location slightly differently. In a studio, if I want to get something just a little bit different, this is one light source. Okay, It's sort of with the same intention as natural light. It's like one light source. So in other words, I want to keep it simple. But I also wanted to have a really high key background. And so how do we do all that? Well, basically, that's just a big softbox with a scrim in front of it to make it even bigger. Um, and basically, the exposure is made for the shadow side of his face to pick up just enough detail. And then the rest of it just gets blown out. There can't be 
in a studio, that's as simple as you can get. And even if you don't have a white background, you can create this with your softbox and a big sheet of translucent paper. Okay, and that's all it is. One light source behind them, just like the natural light outside. This is one light source inside. The same background, creating the same kind of effect, but just a different feel to it. Again, the exposure was made for her face. Okay, and what we've done on this one, instead of just having one light source, which creates the background, which created the same background as the last portrait, in this one, we threw in a small speed light in the front just to pick up on the shadows and give a little kick to the eyes, otherwise the eyes will be dead. And you've got to make sure that you kick up the eyes. So that's again two speed lights by the way. This 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 is from a workshop I've done recently here in, in Selbridge in Dublin in Ireland. Um, and we were using speed lights for most of the day and torches. Okay. Um, this was the same scenario in the room. Uh, I think this particular shot, if I remember correctly, just to get the hair blown, was just a piece of cardboard. And when you want to get hair going, if you have a fan that does it, it's fantastic. But again, some of them can cost a lot of money, or you can go and buy a hair dryer or whatever, or you can just get a big board. And instead of getting somebody to wave it up and down to make hair move, just get them to bring it upwards. In other words, underneath whoever your model is, and then push it up, go one, two, three, whoosh, and then the hair goes all over. Uh, and this is just one light source straight back in, kind of sort of fashion-y type thing, and then the processing is done with a, a cross process and some flare thrown in and so on like that. Okay, a ring light. A ring light is, is a great way to play. It gives you sort of really cool shadows that go all around your subject, get your subject to react to it. Uh, it can be quite hard on the rise, so just remember that. Um, but again, this is a wide angle lens, up close, ring light on, bang, and that's it. One light source, keeping it simple, get in really tight on your subject. Uh, this is done with the ring light as well as the last shot. This was the ring light as well. This is like a, a bit of a homage to David Bailey shot that he'd done years ago of the, the lassie he was courting at the time. Um, and it's just get the poses going, get the face up where you want it. And again, like I say, one flash, one ring light, bang. You could do that very easily with an umbrella or a softbox, no problems as well. So you don't have to have a ring flash to do it. You just get slightly different um, shadows in it, that's all. Okay. This again was done with two speed lights that were clamshelled into the two cheap brollies just so that I had even lighting going up and down on his face. A little bit more on the top than on the bottom, as you can see by the shadow on his nose. So we created that sort of long open loop lighting. We have the highlights in the tops of his eyes, and if you look really closely in the bottom of his eyes, you'll just barely see the little highlights from the flash that's underneath just filling in the shadows and softening it up just a little bit more. And again, this man has, as you can see, no hair. And at the course, people were saying, how do you handle that and why would you crop in? And I think it just makes it a very strong, bold portrait of him, which I was happy to say he did like, which was great. Uh, On-camera flash is a thing that people hate. Now, on-camera flash, if you point it towards something, you can bounce it. But if you point it towards something to bounce and then flag it or put it through maybe a little grid or something so the light can only come back from where it's bouncing off of, an on-camera flash can look like something that's off-camera and it can look like it's coming off a big, huge softbox. And that's what the effect we got here. The flash is actually on my camera, turned to the left to bounce off the wall and instead of it just bouncing off the wall, because some light can still spill out even though it's bouncing, out the edge of the flash, I have literally put a little piece of foam across the flash so that no light spills out of it except directly onto the wall and then directly back to the subject. That's all that is. It's on camera flash, bounced, okay, and flagged, all right? And then when you bring it into Photoshop, you play with it then to, to make it what you want to be. This was created by using a 12 euro 
so I don't know what that would be in sterling, uh, if any of our English friends are listening, probably about, I don't know, nine quid of a torch, okay, that I bought in a shop over here. Um, and again, it's done to prove to lads and lassies on workshops and so on that you don't need to have very, very expensive equipment to be able to go out and, you know, produce really good quality images. Um, so, you know, it's a torch. Uh, the shadow that's on the left that's sort of dividing the wall is just there was a hump in the wall and, and there was a bit of light coming in uh, from a window um, and it just created a shadow that we couldn't get away from. Uh, but the rest of it is just literally one torch, one flashlight lighting that whole subject. Same subject and again this is now using alum chromes with two strip lights okay and the strip lights either to the left or the right of him in really really close background is way off in the distance so that it goes really dark uh, and then all that's there is just him so again it's quite simple lighting getting your poses getting them to look at you getting them to react with you that is something you have to build up over the years with yourself <clears throat> excuse me and your clients and your whoever you have in front of you get that rapport going um, and it's easy when you sort of know somebody I happen to know this particular lad who was modeling for us and it was easier to get him to to do what I needed him to do sort of you know, the one before it you know look down your body line look a little you know really I think what I said to him was look a little pissed off like somebody's annoyed you and that's what we got uh, this one I just wanted him to look very intentively at me down the lens and that was his intense look. So, and actually the outfit that's on him is something I saw him walking in the street with when I met him and I said bring that along to the shoot, the headphones, the whole lot because 90% of the time when you meet this guy and he's walking, that's exactly how he's dressed. Hat on backwards, earphones on, world of his own and he powered him down. So we just got that particular shot of him doing the same thing. This is natural light from a little window that's in my studio uh, at the side of a door and at certain times of the day it's quite intense coming in through it so it's a strip box that I have on my door in my studio and on the left hand side I have a silver reflector pushing the light back in uh, now really it's probably a little bit too close to him because the, the, I'd like a little bit more shadow on that side of his face but it's still a lovely shot, it worked really well uh, and the reason I put them all offset was beside my door I have that poster of this particular uh, exhibition I saw years ago framed and on the wall and I just like the idea of that sort of ghostly body in the background and Ron the way he is there with a very intense stare at me um, and that is daylight, that's just natural light that's out there with a silver reflector going back in this is a strip box of Ron as well, it was a strip box that we used uh, to light him that he just looks straight into and on the background then we, on the back of him we have another light source, another strip box, very low power just to pull his head and his back out from the background. But again it's just very simple, one light scenario, if, which is really the one in front of him lighting him. The one behind him, sorry it's a two light scenario, the one behind him then it's just breaking up the shadows, okay? It's it's not rocket science. Uh, this is some of the courses that I run over here and, and some of the talks you do on lighting is, and that's what I call it, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, it's just light, you know what I mean? Just learn what to do with them and then you can, you know, you can and bend it to the way you need it to, to go. If you start with natural light, move on then to continuous light sources, it's the same sort of thing. You, at least you know you can see everything that's happening um, and basically then a flash is just that millisecond of light that hits rather than being a constant light source and again it'll do nearly the same stuff as the others you just have to learn its little idiosyncrasies and it, it's quite easy to get there. This is the door again with the, the little strip box door that I have like as I say it's most natural light coming in but this time on the left what I done with him it wasn't just a silver reflector it actually I needed a bit more light on him and what I done was I bounced the speed light into the silver reflector to come back in and light him up on the left hand side of his face as you watch it so I used the door more as the accent light this time and the, 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 the speed light became more of my main light you can see that by the highlight here in the zone okay 
We're back to Richard again, two light sources, big soft box, and then a strip light just to take his hair out, but this time looking straight at the camera, really bold, pick up the chest, very proud. Uh, and then when you're out and about, you meet some really, really cool characters. Um, and this is just very low sunshine uh, at the end of the day. We happened to be in, in uh, San Diego, I think it was, and we were going around, walking around, and we came across this underpass that had all these mad looking graffiti paintings and bits and pieces on the wall and this guy told me that he had painted quite a lot of them uh, and he was in an outfit there's dungarees and all those bits and pieces were very colorful uh, with a lot of paint spilled on them so I didn't argue I didn't say no but uh, it's just low sunshine coming in and just make him look into it uh, told him to close his eyes for a few minutes and open them when I told him and then he did and then we got the shot with his eyes open when I'm trying to look around at photographs, uh, I will also try and look for some stories as well. This is a guy who lived in Dublin, he's a poet, he was on television years ago, uh, everything else. And he now sells his book sitting uh, down around O'Connell Street and place like that in Dublin. Uh, a bit sad really in a sense that he was on telly years ago, quite famous, and now he's selling his books and his bits and pieces. I don't know whether it's a a money thing with him or whether he just doesn't like all of that lifestyle anymore and he just wants to be a simple lifestyle like this but if you can get something that has a storyline in it uh, I think it just makes your portraits a little bit more powerful this uh, is lit literally by whatever light was there in the day uh, it was overcast I know we had to push the ISO right up but I don't mind grain I think grain is, is, is all part of what we deal with you know what I mean so you just work with us. Strip lights, these are clients jobs, these are newborn shoots again the lighting in these will be the same as I use for the biker and everything else and the other lads I don't change my lighting even when I'm doing newborns as you can see same strip light that lit up that other lab with the curly hair is lighting that child and that young fella okay uh, and, and again as I say to you it's, it's a case of you know you can use whatever light is around and available for you to make the images that you see. In post-production for this particular wedding shot, the part on the right window where she is, I warmed that part up so I would actually have a contrast between the cool and the warmth in that shot. Okay, Kids, when you're working with them, uh, you've got to come down to their level, not only on their height level, but on their mentality level. So for me to get kids to do things that I want them to do, excuse me, I will tell them like to get her to look out the window there was a pink rabbit in a tutu jumping up and down on a trampoline and then she just turned and looked out the window click 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 she said she didn't see the pink rabbit I said it must have ran away okay so you've got to think on their terms when you're dealing with them uh, light again from windows I will use the same lighting scenario over and over again uh, once I have the location once I have the thing in place, this is a workshop I was away at on Malta. Uh, one of the girls was that was talking about how she works this bohemian effect. Your model makes a big difference too. For if you're going out for an idea, they wanted a bohemian look, so they found a particular model to suit the clothes suited and the location they picked suited. But bringing it into Photoshop is where you put your own touches onto it. Okay, I will every now and again leave my light source in a photograph if I like it there. I'm not saying it works, it works both ways, I have this shot with and without that light source in it. But the light source that lit this shot is a strip box. That's the big soft box behind this particular model again to get the same scenario we done earlier. And that is the strip box beside her, lighting her up, but in post-production I reduced it to a smaller box and took her away up into the top corner because I didn't like it beside her. Okay, so you visualize your shots, you figure out how you want them to work, and then you go after them and make it work for you. Uh, and again, it doesn't matter what your light source is, whether it's outside, inside, uh, whether it's torch, whether it's flash, whether it's an overcast day, whether it's such brilliant sunshine, you can use every light light source 
that's out there and available to you. And just to prove the point about how simple lighting can be, this is from the Society's show last year when I was talking. This is another pass that we went out to shoot for the workshop. We got this shot, this shot, and this shot, uh, just when we were down there shooting with Steph, and it was done like this. These two people are what I call voice-activated light stands. All right. So in other words, my friend on the left is holding one of my torches, and it's going up, up, down, up, down, come in a bit, come in a bit, so I get a stronger light. And the girl on the right was told to up, down, left a bit until she lit up the head of the girl the way I wanted it. And then with post-production, that's the image that we produce. Okay. So that's just one stage of what we it, with my photographs and I'm going to show you some of these now the one thing you've got to remember is that if you don't do your calibrations from the start and have things right um, like when I'm doing my screen for instance I have a spider and I check my screen now Richard is going to come in now in a minute and he's going to explain to you all about the spider but without a proper calibrated monitor Everything I do is a waste of time because if I start to put in fancy colors and fancy bits and pieces, I don't know whether it's right or wrong or what way it's going to work because my screen isn't calibrated. So Rich is going to talk to you for a few minutes and give my throat a little bit of a rest. Um, just explain to you about the spider and how it works and then we'll come back in and show you some befores and afters and then we're going to jump in to show you how the spider cube works and how I use it when I'm out shooting. Um, and then Rich will wrap up with the latest versions of the Spider 5 and everything else and show you all the nuances that's out there now. Are you ready, Rich? Cool. I, I, I am indeed. So, yeah, there we go, Podge. You can hear me and you, can you see my screen now? I can't see it at the moment. All right. There we go. Yep. Yeah. All there we right. Go. We got you. Good stuff. Thanks, mate. So, uh, excellent. Thanks, Podge. I mean, as ever, great to see your images, and uh, it really does go to show what you can do uh, with, you know, as you say, with vision, basically. You know, you obviously have that that capability to 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 actually um, get ahead of the game, think what's what what uh, you know, what lighting is required, what comp what composition is required. But of course, vision is something that can come into play as far as your retouching is concerned in a different fashion. Definitely. And as you said, that's why it's important to make sure that what your vision is showing you as well, your actual optical vision, is correct. Now, you, you did a lot of uh, retouching there, you, you did a, a lot of uh, images, and, and you get those printed, you get sent to lots of different places, and of course the key thing there is if you are working in your images, you are sending them off, if you're, if you're going to be sending them out to print, you need to be soft proofing them. If you're working on them and then retouching them, you know, you, you put a lot of effort into that, a heck of a lot of, uh, of effort and, uh, and thought into to how you're retouching, but of course you need to know that what you're doing, whether it's you know, adding some extra granularity to your shots, adding a tint, adding, adding whatever it may be, it needs to be absolutely what's going to come out. And as you said quite rightly, that's why you need to be calibrating the screens that you're looking at. Now, the Spider is now up to version 5. So for those of those of us who haven't uh, uh, been aware of this, we uh, Data Club launched the, the latest version of the Spider last year, about the middle of last year. And one of the key things that I think um, you're probably already um, appreciating, Podge, and, and, and I certainly do, is the fact that it's been redesigned not only just to, to uh, improve the quality, which has definitely happened, they've improved the sensors in there, they've improved the optics, but great thing for me is the fact that, okay, if I go and work on a different location in different places, I want to show images to people in different places, as I'm doing all the time and as you are as well, the fact that it's now been rebuilt to make it that much more robust is a key thing. You know, as as you can see potentially from the slide now, you know, you've got a lens cap that's been built into it. This is the first device that's ever been redesigned to make it portable in this calibration environment. So, you know, what it's there for is actually to to give you something that uh, it, it's a sensor-based device, and essentially it gives you the opportunity to. Um, uh, to calibrate any type of uh, screen, pretty much that you can plug into a uh, into a computer, a Mac or PC, 
and then as long as you can run the software you can calibrate those devices so even things like projectors can be calibrated certainly with the new version of the spider you can do 4k and 5k screens and the key thing you're doing here is putting those screens and those devices that you're, you're calibrating into an international color standard which means that whatever you're doing when you're retouching or whether you're just editing or viewing images is in a standard that if I look at it, if Podge looks at it and, and we both look on calibrated screens, they should look the same. And if within gamut, if we're, we're then sending them out to, um, to printers, they should come out the same as well as long as we soft proof. And of course, that's what we're doing here. We're, we're using a spider to do exactly that. They've improved the speed now with the spider 5 as well, so in particular with the Pro and the Elite versions, which are the two top versions of the spider. You've got the capability of running the software on your machines, in, and, and the recalibration time is, is pretty much half the time it used to be. So therefore, when you get to a new venue, if you're going to be working, say you're down in that subway and you want to be looking at those those uh, images that you're taking of uh, the models down there on site, great, recalibrate quickly, get it done. And that's why it's beneficial that the, the Spider now is a much more robust device. And as you can see, all, all, the way it works basically is by running a bunch of colors in front of the eye of the device, it reads those colors and therefore at the end of that process, all you have to do is hit the save button and it calibrates the screen you've just, calib you, you've just been running the Spider on, i.e. puts that screen into that international standard. So. Great way of uh, making sure that what you're doing isn't wasted, that you're not adjusting images detrimentally, that you are actually seeing what's going to come out, that WYSIWYG, that what you see is what you get is what we're trying to do there. Key thing about the, the new Spider, as mentioned, is robust, able to handle the latest type of screens. It's actually got the optics in there, encapsulated in a, in a type of um, a resin, if you like. So that that means that it's it's much more robust, and, and and you know you can chuck it in and out of a bag. So everything else previously, by anybody that's produced uh, calibration devices, has really been aimed at working just in an office, just in a studio, just in one location, not to be taken with you and being used on the move. But that's absolutely what we've done with the Spider Five because we're all working on mobile now. We're all working um, out there on laptops when we're retouching, and so. Good, good improvements there. Just to let you know, I mean, just just before we pop back to Podge, he's going to now take you through some of the um, the ways in which he works in a photo shoot. You've seen some of the the images he's been working or he's done in the past and the, the befores and afters there. But just so you're aware, there are three different types of spider or spider five. But the good thing about it is it's physically exactly the same unit now. Whether you go for the entry level express, the general pro photographer's version, which is the pro, or the top of the range high-end photographers and studio version which is the elite so physically exactly the same you can if you want to just start with an express and upgrade later on as a chargeable upgrade to upgrade later on but actually probably more cost-effective to, to actually choose the right one for you um, now all of them though come because of the same physical build come with that same robust build but the key thing there, the differences are that the Express doesn't have the ambient light sensor turned on, which is the little white dot you can potentially see on the back of the uh, the spider on the packet there. And that's what's sensing the, the lighting conditions that you're in. So if you are down in a subway, in a church, in a new building, wherever it may be, and you want to recalibrate your screen just to make sure it's showing you correct colors, then having that that ambient light sensor turned on as well, which the Pro and the Elite do, the Pro being the next step up, the, the mid-range device if you like, that's really important and that's what also helps the Pro and the Elite get uh, recalibration times down to, to pretty much half the time of the uh, the Express for that, uh, that when you run a calibration. So a couple of, two or three minutes basically to recalibrate basically with, with a Pro or an Elite. Just so you're aware, the, the Elite, one of the key differences there with the Elite is you can do multi-point sampling so you can check across the screen for hot spots. So if you're really keen to make sure you're retouching an absolutely accurate environment, then that's important. And also you can studio match to force all of your screens to, uh, to, to match exactly with the Elite. Lastly, if you do want to use projectors, if you want to be using projectors to show your work, you do need the Elite if you want to calibrate those projectors. But the important thing is you can, so you can be showing those, those images that you're creating and making sure they're seen the way you intend them to be by using an Elite to calibrate your projectors. But there you are. There's enough of a, an update there to give you a little glimpse of what's been going on with Data Color and the Spider. We'll hand back to, to Podge now to, uh, to let him carry on with uh, what, uh, what he's been um, 
uh, up to basically and more to the point what he's been uh, uh, what is or the way in which he goes about running a, a photo shoot so uh, Podge we're, we're handing back to you I think we can can you uh, we can indeed can you see, see me you. now yep you've, you've come up indeed can you well, see the screen there now I can indeed you uh, the, the, the beauty uh, again about that spider and again the spider 5 remember guys when, when you're out there is as I said we're putting an awful lot of time into shooting and I, I, I do apologize boys I think I'm going to run over tonight on time um, but if we're going out to shoot and spend time on models you know equipment locations and everything else and then come back to a monitor that's not right you're wasting your time so you know ju just get that into your heads and um, because if I want to go out now and I shoot and I want to do these in two so you can see the befores and afters together uh, if I come back in and I start putting in blue tones, I want to make sure that when I'm printing they'll become blue. Um, and, and before, years ago, without the calibration, I was doing this, but it wasn't coming back the way it was on my screen. And it's very frustrating. It, it like it's hair pulling, you know, your boy, it's this, that, and the other. And it's just because I wasn't calibrating my screens and monitors and so on like that. So just just be aware of that. It's very, very important. Um, on the left, you'll see these coming up, which is the ones that come out of camera. Um, and what we do to them. Now I have a thing about processing, I don't care, I push my images to the limits uh, but that's just because I like doing it, some people don't, some people do, uh, I do um, and the thing about processing is that it's been done for years, like straight out of the camera I've never been that lucky to have something that can straight out of the camera that I never had to touch, okay, but I know people who are very, you know, that do do it and they're ex excellent at it, just for me it doesn't, so I will always play with an image, plus the fact I always know there's more in there and I want to put a bit of texture into it or pull out some texture and so on. So as you can see here, not only did I put tones in, I put in a couple of flocks of words because I just hadn't the time to wait for them to come over. So I have things that I you can use to put things in like clouds and everything else like that as well. Although most of those clouds that are there were there, it's just with the software then we can pull them out. Okay. Uh, in the again with the landscapes and so on before and after. The reason that the, the one on the left is sort of tilting, and I shoot a lot in black and white, I shoot JPEG and RAW, okay, uh, and a lot of people ask me why do I shoot JPEG and RAW, because a lot of my time when you look at back at my screen and my camera, it's actually shooting and it's you're seeing the black and white image from the day. I, I'm, I love black and white and I will shoot in black and white a lot more. Uh, and then later on then I know I have the colour version there if I want it as well. Um, but I have a JPEG black and white already out of camera. Now it does a reasonably good job but again you'll see on the right how much you can push it. The reason the one on the left is leaning is that little puddle of water it was very small and my friend Ken was at the back of me holding my trousers so that I couldn't, I didn't because I was leaning in and he was making sure I didn't slip and fall into the mud because if I did I wasn't getting back in his car. So that's why it's tilting but then again when you go into work your images, this is what you can do, you can tilt them up and straighten them up and then bring out the textures and so on. So having an idea of before and after, I'm not going to go through them all because we're running short on time, uh, just having an idea of one from it. As you can see on the left it's a rectangular shot but on the right it's nearly square. So square format to me is beautiful as well because I come from the the square format days of the Hazzies and so on. Um, so I love the square format and I play a lot with it. On the left is the untouched image, so the image on the left was shot to give the idea of low sunshine coming in. That is a strip box, and I'm sorry now that I never stood back another few inches and took a shot with the actual box in there just to show people. It was a, a strip box on a studio flash on a battery to give me the light because we were losing light rapidly that day, um, and that's what it gave me, that sort of burst into the drummer these musicians in which I was shooting and then the cool tones are put in as well and afterwards. We use the drawing on the left you can see I have where my model is, the windows that we had in the room so everything was balanced all around so I can have the outside as well and then as you can see just here uh, I have my low LID which sounds really good that my assistant was helping it. It sounds great like I have an assistant. He's actually a friend of mine who was stood there that day. And the video light is lighting up Dorian here, my model. 
to make sure that I got the balance then that she wasn't being too much underexposed and so on. And that's just a continuous light source being used in with natural light so you can balance them all out. Okay. Uh, and let me see, I'll give you another one, I'll give you this one here, just to show you the difference before and after with the torch. So you can see how much texture and everything else that was brought out afterwards using the likes of Photoshop, using the likes of plugins, which I'm hopefully going to get into to show you at least one or two images as well, just before we finish tonight. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of the befores and afters like, as, as the way I do them and so on. So when I'm shooting an image, I have an idea. in my head or you know whatever it'll be uh, I'm gonna put a texture in maybe to soften up the background to give it a moody feel uh, if the image which I've done this on a couple of occasions if the image is not as razor sharp as I'd have liked it to be because maybe I picked the wrong aperture in other words I shot maybe at f2 or 1.8 f2 and one of the eyes just a little bit soft I'll actually put a little bit of softener in all over the image to give it that effect um, it's called spoofing after the idea is done. In other words, when your client comes back, you say, no, no, that's that's what we meant to happen. You know what I mean? That's the way it was done. It's done for that particular thing. So, you know, I will use whatever we have to make it work. For, okay? Now, these few images I'm going to show you here, these are not mine. These are, these are probably other famous photographers. I'm just going to bring these up very quickly just to get people's heads around processing and everything else. This is Pablo Picasso, and the image was taken, and it was taken by this guy. When I take this up, you'll see. His name was Arnold. On the right is the original image, the way it was done on there, and it was a large format camera and so on. But look at the crop, okay? So, you know, people think that, like, years ago, cameras came out, you know, of these big photographers, when they took these shots, they never changed anything. They never done anything to their images. They came straight out of the camera. Printed that was done, and Pablo. I'm afraid I can't have the name in in Rio, so I think his name is pronounced. He's the printer that I printed for him. These are these worksheets that these people had for the final image. Okay, so if you do like processing your images in Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever other process is out there for you, don't let anybody ever put you off by. Telling you, oh, it worked that way. Okay. Now I'm just going to show you these two. Uh, this when we were away in holidays recently, uh, and you can see here that we have the spider cube in his hand. Okay. Now, and the idea of the black and white up here is just to show you. This is the way I shoot now with all my cameras. I have my JPEG set on and my RAW. So I shoot my JPEG will always be black and white, and my RAW image. Now that's a bit of a cheat too, because I mean sometimes what I do do is my processing as well because if I want specific images black and white I've already got them a reasonable decent half black and white and then I just need to tweak them instead of having to go into my raw image process my raw image and then convert it it's just my way of doing it I'm not saying it's right I'm not saying it's wrong just my way of doing it now as you can see here he's very happy I had him in the cold and the rain and I had him holding the cube what I love about the cube the spider cube is even though I have the spider checker as well the color checker as well the spider checker is 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 that it's a bit bigger and you'll see another shot now where I have them both together and I use these at the start of the shoots but when I'm away on holidays sometimes you know you're limited to what you can bring I can always bring the cube because that'll fit in my pocket that'll fit in the camera bag in, in a little corner of the camera bag under the camera on top of the camera it's one of the easiest things to carry around with you and as you can see here if I bring this up if I can make this go a bit bigger um, which it doesn't seem to want to do for me that's I'll be showing now in camera raw. Um, yeah, da, 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 there we go. When what you have is you have the silver, which gives you your highest highlights. You have your grays, you have your whites, and your black. And you've got this little hole in here, which is pure black. Okay. Now. The easiest way for me using this is very simple. When I take the shot, as you can see, it's an overall shot there. The first thing I do then is go up here to my, on the top of my panel in Camera Raw in Photoshop. I pick on my um, white balance dropper, eyedropper, 
Now, again, depending on what you want to do, you can either pick the black, the whites, the greys. This will be told to you from different photographers, different ways of the way they do it. I usually pick on the grey, okay? And I usually have this spider cube pointed directly at me, and I have, hopefully, a light in the dark side where the light's hitting my subject and so on. This was fairly flat lighting. This was when we were in Venice the other week and it was pissing rain. So it was typical Irish weather in, in Italy. Um, so it's, it's, it doesn't have a very heavy shadow. You can see here the lighting is quite flat. It's not a really heavy shadow. So I would hit somewhere like this. And what it does, it's very subtle. And you may not see this um, on the screens. And this is what worries me now on the screen. But I'm going to do this again. I'm going to bring it back to where it was originally. Um, just so we you can, can have this. Put. Can you see it happening? Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can Brilliant. See it I, was, yeah. I was a bit worried now in case it didn't show up there. Uh, what I was going to say is if you look here at the temperature, it's 4 8. But as soon as I hit the grey, it balances it up to 5 2. So nearly full daylight. So I'm nearly back to a nice daylight balance. Now, when you get this happening for you, the beauty about this now is. It, I know, for instance, now that that is more or less balanced out to being a proper colour that I was that should be there on the day. Now it's personal. Now I can decide. No, I like it. cooler so I can bring my I mean that that's right okay but by actually having something like the and I know now exactly where I'm starting from that the image I'm starting to work on has a good color balance so when I start to fix it and play with it and remember I'm on my calibrated monitor which you all should be on now at this stage and um, we know that anything we start doing to it the colors I'm seeing will be what will come out on my prints later on, okay? And don't forget that we, we, we also have, you know, data color, when I say we, I mean data color also have the calibrator for our papers as well. So, I mean, we have a complete workflow that works for us. So I know after I soft proof and I print, happy days, it comes out for me, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drop that down again, just go back in here to bridge for a minute to this particular shoot now this, uh, and Rich is going to come in now in, in another few minutes with this and um, this shoot is that fresh be honest now I'm raw okay uh, Rich you might uh, spoiler checker you might bring it in Sorry, Poch, your, your audio is dropping when you're moving the, uh, uh, the cursor there. Okay, did, did you hear you hear me now? I, I can hear you Hello? now. Mate, yeah. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, just when I show them here, what I'm going to do then, Rich, will you bring them into Lightroom and show them how you would use the checker? Yeah, I'll fine. Show yeah, I, I'll show the, the, the spider checker. If yeah. we get time, I mean, you know, it, it, it's... it's uh, how are we on time? Oh, I'm already running late. I'm sorry. I talk a lot. I know. Before you... You, you, just, not, you just don't talk quick enough, mate. That's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> if I was talking quick enough, no one would be understanding me. Um, <laughs> I'm only going to take... I'll take four or five images in this just so you see how it works, okay? Uh, so we'll take the first image, and the reason I'll take the first image, if I hit it here, you will see, holding not only my spider cube, but my spider checker, okay? So let's just pick, we'll pick that one, we'll pick that. That one. And, and those ones. Open them up with uh, for Photoshop and Camera Raw. Two ways, okay? You can do it in such a way that, as Rich will show you, hopefully in Lightroom, you get a chance. There's a way you can bring in and have a little piece that goes over all the colors. I'm just going to show you two ways that I would use it here. Uh, very quickly, one, I'll pick the image that it is and I'll have the other images underneath it. Now you can do this again, which is brilliant because it gives you 
choice. Uh, Rich, can you see that again changing on screen? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah. Cool. You can see the way it neutralizes it again. Okay, and again it gets personal. Now all I did was hit, and you can hit on any one of these that you prefer. Some people would like to go into the black and hit the black. Some people hit the grey. I usually just come in here, pick the one that I know that's working for me, and I hit there, and the, the second one down is the one I use. Or I will use the grey here, and it depends on the lighting as well. Now I've neutralized the image. I then go select all, on all the images, and then I'll go synchronize. Now, because I haven't done anything with the exposures or anything else, all I literally want is to synchronize the white balance. So I will just go in there very quickly, and I will switch all them off very, very quickly, and I will go boom. Now I have neutralized, and all of those images have been neutralized. Now I can either turn that one off, throw it away, do what I want for it, but now all of these images, now I can decide whether I want this to be really cool, in other words, will I relate to the sort of sky that we have, or I can make it a bit warmer, it's up to you. But I would rather have it on landscape and portraiture, I decided I'd put a person in a landscape and we'll do a little bit of work very quickly on the image just to show you both of them together. So we're going to pick that particular image. I'm just going to, want to reduce the size of these things up just a little bit, okay, so that when we do a bit of work, it will be a little bit quicker, and I'll press open. Now I've neutralized the image. I've done a few little bits to it. I'm now in Photoshop. I play for, there is a vision in your head, there's not a lot of vision. For this one particular detail in these, I make these really crunchy, the trees and the dead wood all around her, uh, and the sky as well. So what we'll do is we'll do one or two quick things to it, and then we'll pass you over to Rich then, just to, to, to give you an idea of how the color checker works in Lightroom as well, okay? I use an awful lot of uh, plugins for, for a lot of things. Um, although I can do it all in Photoshop, I need to speed things up. So I will use plugins where it's handy. These are my Nick plugins, okay? Um, we used to be heavily involved with Nick in Ireland years ago uh, until Google took them over, but I still love them because they are one of the best plugins out there as far as I'm concerned. Uh, as you can see, quite a lot of different functions in there as well. Everything that I can to get my vision out there, what I want people to see. And that's what this is all about. It's your vision, so use it the way you want to do it. One of the biggest plugins I use an awful lot of would be Color Effects Pro 4. Okay. Now, again, maybe a later stage you might do another webinar where I won't just think it's worth it or used to. Uh, but the idea of this is just to show you it's very quickly at least one process just to give you an idea of what we can do. Um, the, the idea of the plug-in and the, the tonal contrast is that on the filters on the right hand side we have our controls in the middle obviously our picture. When we go down here to where tonal contrast is you will see that here there's a little bunch of pictures, sort of little, it just gives you a little sort of like stack of pictures. You click on that and it gives you presets. And by clicking the presets, you going to do to the, can be very soft, so it can, this can be quite good for skin softening, uh, or you can bring out the clouds, or I can use these control points, and control points are a fabulous way of being able to sort of add and take stuff away from, as I put a control point over 
the area, if I look down to the right hand side, I see a loop, which gives me a 100% view of the image. So I know I'm going to click in the right spot. I click there, that area, and it will take me. Okay? So now. Now I can actually add that there. And but you, you get an idea. Or Linda herself there now, we will see that when I switch this on and off, the effect is all around her, but not on her. You see? It on her skin and everything else, we have sort of just taken it away, and we're getting this, and that literally was a hailstorm that came in on top of us two minutes later. Um, but the if we think it's a now because I'm Russian take image I'm Lloyd film and put it through a process for color print which would be quite nice and then what we can do then is add another image Which we just add another will be there. Uh, you can make it clean or rough. I like a little bit rougher. We make it a little bit smaller, and then we make the the spread a little bit more. And in three, four, five clicks, when we say up okay, there now, and it's done. Now you don't destroy your image because the beauty is, and be very careful when you're buying some of these. Um, plugins and so on that they don't embed within the image because you're better off to make sure that they come in as a layer because then it's non-destructive which means that you're not damaging the original underneath you can play around with it. Uh, the other thing too then of course is that you can actually you know bring some of the image from behind back because you can add a mask onto it so if I had a mask on there and I thought that was a bit heavy here on the trees by adding a mask from my palette down here on the bottom the mask is white, so it's shown everything. If I click on the mask and then go over here and take a brush from my tool palette and make sure I'm on black, once I paint black on white, I will then hide that effect. Now I'll do it at 100% so you can see. See this happening that I've just put in. But I don't want it to be taken down fully, so I'm going to take it down by about. 30%. Okay. I put my opacity of my brush to about 30%. Make a smaller brush. Now, one thing I would also do is on a, a lot bigger. It's for when I
uh, very quickly so that you can see how it works. Uh, and, and as I said, cube as well on top, which is great. Um, so you can have the cube and you can have your spider checker there, as color checker, spider color checker as well, which is brilliant. Uh, and, and it means that you're going to get the very, very best to start off with your image, okay? And then once you have your monitor calibrated and everything else like that, sure you you know the the only thing there thing you get that set up, and then you don't have any other issues. So guys, hopefully that's helped in some way. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, hopefully you could understand the Irish accents. <laughs> and I'll hand you back over to Richard and Boris. Cheers, thanks, Potch. Thank you, Kindly. Um, so I, I'm afraid I, I I don't know whether those that uh, are watching lost some of the audio there. I, I certainly did, I'm afraid. So hopefully that will come through on the recording. Sorry, uh, with, yeah, oh, not your fault, mate. I, I'm afraid uh, uh, it may well be just bandwidth at my end. But um, uh, let me just uh, swap over to to my good self anyway to uh, just take you through the last bit of. Uh, of what we've been uh, what we've been talking about, I, 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 we've, we're already over time, folks. I'm just very, very, very quickly going to give you a quick whirlwind idea of how to use the spider checker, which uh, um, which Podge was t telling us about. There, Podge, can you see my screen now? Right? I can see your yeah. screen there now. Yes. Good man. Good man. Cool. Right. So, uh, so basically, just a, a quickie. <laughs> Really, um, you know, just to reiterate what Pod was saying, the, the key thing about what we're, we're trying to do with the spider checker is give you a frame of reference to make sure you're capturing your colors accurately at the first part of your, your workflow, basically. So it gives you the opportunity to get colors correct. Now, unfortunately, I don't have some, some lovely images like, uh, like Pod was using there, but I, I've got uh, some images, as well, at least, that show some, some differences in the same, and I'll use the term loosely, models uh, in different lighting conditions appearing differently and this is what so using something like the spider checker or the spider cube but the spider checker in particular can do the, the spider cube can take out overall color casts and neutralize across as Podge has already showed you the spider checker is essentially a, a large chart uh, folds flat actually so it folds, folds in two uh, that allows you to get your colors correct and the key thing about it being large is when you're doing photography of group scenes, of landscapes, of larger areas basically, you do if you're metering in camera, need to capture the whole of the area that you're going to be shooting or as, as much of it as you can when you're shooting your spider checker beforehand such that you're not just metering for the actual target you're, you're shooting, you need to, to hold that camera open. As you, as you saw with Podge's shots where he was capturing the background and the model there that he wanted to set the colors correctly for. So let's quickly show you how you use it. Basically you shoot it in each of the lighting conditions you're, you're working in, it gives you the opportunity to have a frame of reference that you can then use very swiftly what we will do here is we'll say as Podge did we'll just set our white balance for this now cropped cropped in software not in camera um, uh, capture of the spider checker image here we'll then quickly just check our highlight and our shadow on these two squares here this should be 96 percent it is roughly if it isn't just adjust your exposure this square down the bottom here should be four percent it is again roughly if it isn't correct you should use, shut, uh, adjust that using your flax adjustment in your a right hand side in this case of Lightroom or it could be in Camera Raw for instance but then the most important part is the software that comes with the spider checker that is the spider checker app this is the bit that does the the clever part you personally or we personally couldn't individually go in and choose all the colors uh, that are on this chart and be able to adjust them uh, ourselves basically we, we, we would have to manually go in uh, and, and adjust one at a time and of course by adjusting one you'd move the colors out on the other color on the chart what we're doing here with the spider checker we're quickly making a calibration of all 48 parts using the the these what I'm moving around now on screen is the sample points for each of those 48 squares on the photograph all we need to do is hit save calibration give it a name Count three, and okay, that then saves our calibration into, in this case, uh, Lightroom. We can then apply that calibration to obviously this image to see a subtle change in the colors, but more importantly, we can then group those presets that you're creating here together and stick them into a little folder. I've got some marked 
here in this S and J wedding folder, which means that okay, if I have a look at those photos that were taken in different environments, as long as I've taken a shot of this spider checker in each of those environments, I can then go in there and I can correct each of those uh, color environments to give the correct lighting conditions in each case. So if I hit inside reception, great, I've now corrected that for inside the reception. If I go into the joys of the church, great, I can now correct that image for in the church, in fact. Uh, if I go into the, the joys of, uh, sorry, that was, I <laughs> beg your pardon, I wonder why that was looking rather odd. Actually, that's outside the church, of course, isn't it? So rather than looking strangely blue, it should be looking like that. In fact, we're going to have a look at the before and after here to see that obviously what we're doing by doing this calibration is we're getting our images correct. So the groom in this instance was wearing a grey suit, not a not a blue suit, as were the groomsmen. The skin tones weren't all bleached out as they appear here, they were a lot more tanned. That's what we're correcting with here. This is the before and after. After on the right hand side where we've applied the correction due to using the spider checker basically. And if I go in back into the church now and apply the in the church calibration, just so you see that. Again, calibration there, just correcting it so the suit colors are now correct. And of course it all bounces across the entire photo shoot as Paj was showing earlier on, just by using the, 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 uh, the, the clicking of the, the white balance tool. But here, as opposed to just removing a color cast, we're actually setting all of the colors to be absolutely correct. There you are, that was a very quick uh, run through. If you want to see more about the spider check, you can come back to us in, the, in one of our other webinars or catch up on one of our webinars online. If you want to find out more, we also have a whole bunch of videos online uh, on YouTube, for instance, if you go and search for the, the, the word next tech there, N-E-X-T-T-E-K, you can actually see a whole bunch of videos how to use the equipment we've been talking about today and get more tips and tricks. Um, also, we have a, an ebook that uh, is currently being updated, actually, so uh, watch out for our new ebook coming out shortly, uh, which will give you more color management tips and tricks. And of course, we are over, but if you do have any questions we don't manage to finish uh, off uh, in our chat session tonight, you can always go to our free phone support line there and ask your questions to our illustrious team of technicians via that uh, free phone support number. It is a double zero eight hundred seven hundred eight hundred seventy in Europe number. That double zero the start is for a European free phone number. Or you can go to the, the support line on the uh, the, the uh, website there to pop in your questions in person. That's that's it, folks. That's us done on the presentation side of things. And, and as I say, we've crammed a lot in tonight. And thank you very much to Podge for for uh, all his his hard work there in uh, in running through. Um, you know some very uh, compelling and uh, and inspirational images there, and very quickly, you know, showing us uh, how he, he gets to some of that uh, at the end of the session there. And perhaps we'll get Podge back to do a, a more detailed look at uh, at his retouching and so on. Of course, key thing as he said, you know, having a calibrated screen very important when you're doing any form of creative work, or basically even if you're just taking photos looking at them and printing them out. You need to be able to soft proof them to that output, so you need to be able to see those images correctly on a calibrated screen. So there was a lot in that session tonight, folks. Uh, we, we've uh, still got a lot of you with us, so if you do have questions now, we're going to open up the uh, the chat or the, the, the questions area so you can type in questions yourself. Um, uh, we're, we're 